Will it work? Will it not work? And if not, why not? Hey, welcome back. In a previous video, we took a look at the concept of tunneling with IP traffic over a network, and I'll, I'll put a card for it, I think, right there. <laughs> so if you haven't checked out that video, take a quick peek at that. And in this video, here's what we're going to cover. I'd like to address how we can implement, if we have Cisco gear at two different sites, how we can implement a site-to-site -site tunnel, and more importantly, how we can protect that traffic. So if somebody steals it or is eavesdropping on that tunnel traffic, they won't be able to make sense of it because it's encrypted. So let's use this topology here with these two routers, R1 and R2, which are both connected to the publicly routable internet. And if we wanted to build a tunnel, let's go ahead and draw the tunnel visually. So we're, we're working on building this logical tunnel that they can use to communicate with each other over the internet. The way we would do that on a Cisco router is we'd go into configuration mode and then we'd specify interface tunnel and then we'd specify the tunnel interface that we want to create. So if you don't have any tunnel interfaces, the numbering is like from 0 to 11 billion. It's a lot. So you can just say tunnel 0 to start off. And that puts us into interface configuration mode for this tunnel. And then we would specify a few details, such as where does this tunnel start from R1's perspective? And the answer is going to be the tunnel is going to start from 15.1.1.1. That's its interface connected to the internet. And where is this tunnel going to end? And the ending point of this tunnel is going to be at 25.2.2.2. That's the IP address on R2 that's connected to the internet. So we do that respectively on both sides. R1 and R2 would both specify the starting point from their perspective and the ending point for that tunnel. Now, the other part that we need to do to make this tunnel functional is we need to give each of these tunnel interfaces an IP address. And that's going to boil down to planning on what do we want to use for IP addressing. Now, for these IP addresses, they don't have to be routable on the internet because these are going to be inside. The actual packets, as seen on the internet, look like they're coming from 15.1.1.1 going to 25.222. And so the tunnel interface can be any IP address space that we want to use. So if we wanted to, we could say we want this tunnel to be the 10.12.12.0 network. I'm just using that because it's going to go between R1 and R2. And then we give IP addresses in that subnet to each of the router interfaces. So interface tunnel 0, maybe we give it dot 1 on the 10.12.12 network. And the tunnel interface in R2, maybe we give it dot 2. And once we've done so, and if these two routers have reachability to the other side of the tunnel, boom! Our tunnel is built. So let me show you what that would look like from R1's perspective. If we do a show run for interface tunnel 0, which I already have built and set up, Here's its configuration. It says the tunnel source is its IP address. The tunnel destination is the IP address of R2. And the IP address that we're using on that interface is 10.12.12.1. I did the same thing over on R2, except I changed the source and destination based on R2's perspective. Let me show you that too. So here in R2, if we do a show run for interface tunnel 0, we can see the exact flip of that. So it has an IP address on the 10.12.12 network. I gave it .2, and the tunnel source is its own IP address, and the tunnel destination is the IP address of R1 on the other side. So if we did a show IP route, it's going to show as a directly connected network the 10.12.12 network, and if we try to ping 10.12.12.1 and press Enter, all that traffic is going over the tunnel. Now, the question might come up, well, Keith, how do you verify that's really going over the tunnel and not just being routed normally over the internet? <laughs> and the way we can verify that is with a packet capture. Let me show you. So if we were going to go ahead and capture the traffic as it crosses over the simulation here of the public internet, I'll just go ahead and right click it, click on capture, specify the interface, and away we go. I'll also make that a little bigger so it's easier to see. So here we have some CDP messages and so forth. But if we send some traffic, in fact, let's go ahead and on R2, we'll do a ping to 10.12.12.1. Let's also set the size to 1,000, 1,000 bytes. And also let's specify that we want to go ahead and send a specific data pattern. So I'll say data 7777. So what that's going to do, it's going to send us a very specific pattern that we can recognize as we look at that data on the network. So there's five pings. If we go back to our packet capture and grab any one of these, here it is with all the sevens in hexadecimal, and the ASCII equivalent of those is a bunch of Ws. So what's happening here when we do those pings, R2 is saying, oh, how do I reach that address? And from its routing table, it says use the tunnel because it's a directly connected network, and it takes that ping request. So we'll say right here is the ping with the original source and destination IP address information, and then it adds a GRE header, the generic routing and encapsulation protocol, and then it places in the outside header, the one the internet sees, the actual IP addresses of the source and destination 
before it forwards that traffic. So all the internet sees is, hey, here's a packet from 25222 to 15111, and it sees the layer four protocol as GRE, and then inside that it has the original payload. And you know what the good news is? We can verify that because I've got the packet capture still open. Let's go take a peek. So here in the packet capture, if we take a look at the actual payload, it's ICMP, it's an echo request, and then we have an IPv4 header, but that IPv4 header that we see right here, the original packet, has been encapsulated in the layer 4 protocol of GRE, which is protocol number 47. And then for the outside IP header, the one that the internet sees, it has the source address of 25.222 and the destination address of 15.1.1.1. But the big problem is we're not encrypting that data. If an eavesdropper, an ISP, anybody in the path on the internet takes that packet and looks at the payload, they can plainly see exactly what it is. There's absolutely no confidentiality regarding those IP packets. And that's where we bring to the table a little protocol called IPsec, which is really a family of protocols that can help encrypt and protect the data while it's in transit. And because we have a tunnel interface that's currently working, all we need to do is apply an IPsec profile to that tunnel interface and it automatically says, great, I get it. Anytime I send traffic through the tunnel, I will encrypt it. And then the other side of that tunnel can then decrypt it. So we're protecting that data as it crosses over the internet. So for this demonstration, I've got an IPsec profile already configured. I'm simply going to apply that IPsec profile to the tunnel interface and boom, we're done. Let's do it. And here's the syntax. We went into interface configuration mode for the tunnel and we said tunnel protection, IPsec profile, and the name of a profile that I had previously created and boom, it's done. Now he's saying, I'm not too happy about this because the other side of the tunnel is not yet configured. Let's go over to R2 and we will apply the same config over there because it also has an IPsec profile already created. I'm simply applying that profile to the interface. So now on either one of the routers, if we wanted to look at the Ike phase one and the Ike phase two tunnel information, we do a show crypto isocamp SA for the Ike phase one tunnel information. And if we want to see the Ike phase two tunnel or the IPsec tunnel, we can do a show crypto IPsec SA for security association and there it is. So this is showing us the number of packets encrypted and decrypted as well as the interesting traffic. So even though we're not using a crypto map, which is an older way of doing it, because we applied the IPsec profile to a GRE tunnel interface, here it specifies that any traffic between these two peers, if it happens to be protocol 47, which is the protocol number for generic routing and encapsulation, go ahead and encrypt it. And here's what that means in measurable terms. Now, if we send traffic over this tunnel between these two devices, anybody who's eavesdropping in the middle will not be able to make sense of the contents of the data because they simply don't have the keys to unlock the data. And that's one of the benefits of IPsec. We're protecting that data through encryption. So to verify that here on R2, let's go ahead and do that same ping we did earlier. Ping over to 10, 12, 12, 1, 1,000 bytes, and we'll send a data pattern of 7777. The capture is still running. Let's go take a look at the capture. At layer four, it's pointing to the layer four protocol of ESP, which is protocol 50. Now, this is the important part. All that data that previously was a bunch of www in ASCII or 7777 in hex, all that information is now encrypted. And the only two devices that can make sense of this data and have the ability to encrypt and decrypt it respectively are R1 and R2, the two ends of this tunnel. So it was a GRE tunnel. We put the IPsec profile on it and now it's an IPsec site to site tunnel. So the goal is of having an IPsec tunnel is taking traffic from one site like the 1010 network with PC1 and protecting that traffic with IPsec as it gets shipped over the tunnel over to site two like PC2. So my question for you is this, is the tunnel going to be used to protect that traffic between PC1 and PC2 and PC2 and PC1 or not. So if you would think about that for a moment in the comments below, I'd love your opinion. It will be protected or it won't be protected or maybe the traffic won't even work at all. I'd like to know your feedback. So put that in the comments below and we'll follow it up with another video that helps identify, will it work? Will it not work? And if not, why not? So we'll take a look at all that in the next video. So thanks for joining me for a few moments today in this video. I've enjoyed being with you and I'll catch you in the next video. Until I found you right there